This is Software Engineering Radio, the podcast for professional developers on the web at se-radio.net. SE Radio brings you relevant and detailed discussions about software engineering topics at least once a month. Thanks to our audience and the partners listed on our website for supporting the podcast. Hello, this is Scott Jensen. I am here with Steve Will, who is the chief architect of the IBM I, traditionally known as OS 400. Good morning. How are you, Steve? I'm doing very well today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for joining me today. Well, why don't we begin? Maybe you can just introduce yourself, uh, your role at IBM. I am the chief architect for IBM I, and we'll talk quite a bit about what IBM I is. It's an IBM operating system, and chief architect uh, in my role I'm responsible for the strategy for this operating system and the plan. So I'm involved in setting what we're going to be spending our money on, how our developers are going to be spending their time, looking out into um, three to five year time frame for what customers are going to need and what the industry is going to be presenting. I've been at IBM for 26 years now. Uh, I work in the Rochester, Minnesota lab. I came here directly out of uh, college and then out of graduate school. I graduated with a degree in computer science and mathematics from Luther College in Decorah, Iowa, and then I got my master's degree in computer science at Purdue University. So IBM has been where I've spent my career, and I have essentially spent my career on this platform and its predecessors. Why don't we just dive right into the platform itself? Why don't you briefly describe for us IBM I and introduce us to it? Okay. Well, IBM I is an operating system that's used by hundreds of thousands of businesses throughout the world. Uh, it got its start. Its architecture was um, initially created at its lowest level with the System 38 back in the 1970s and then grew into uh, the AS400, which maybe many of your listeners would have heard of. But over time, uh, the AS400, which had its own proprietary software, uh, grew up and merged in its technologies, its underlying hardware and I.O. technologies, with other systems within IBM. And so now IBM I is the integrated operating system that's what I stands for is integration, the integrated operating system that sits on top of power systems. Talk to us a little bit about why, why I, why, why IBM I, what, what is different about this platform than so many other platforms, and why is it not generally heard nearly as much as, say, uh, a Windows or a Linux? Okay. So I is, from its architecture, um, very business oriented. When the architecture was put together initially, the idea was that businesses want to run their businesses and not their computers. And our architects knew that we had to put together an integrated platform that would be exceptionally easy to use. And so they de decided from the very beginning to create an operating system that was going to be object-based, so it would be very difficult to do anything wrong, that it was going to have an integrated database that had a lot of automated features that other platforms would require a database administrator professional to, to do operations, instead have the system do those operations for them. Built on several architectural concepts, including something called single level store, and then our multiple workload management system, which is a subsystem based system that allows customers to essentially forget about many of the management technology or management uh, experiences and requirements that are on other platforms so we really are from an architectural view significantly different and we can talk about that of course later but one of the reasons that you don't hear much about us is that we got sold into the small and medium business markets in the United States in Europe, in fact, around the world in the 90s, and those folks who bought us, they're not out there trying to uh, talk about what technology they have. And in general, they don't even really care. They care about the business that they have. And as those businesses grew into some of the largest businesses into the world, in the world, they also adopted other technologies around them. 
And so they don't go out and trumpet that they're running eye. But in fact, so many of the businesses that you deal with on a day-to-day basis are actually using IBM I, and they're using it very successfully and have been for years. I have a number of different specific examples of clients who are using the platform. Um, Sometimes I have to get special permission, but let me just give you an idea. If you live uh, in Europe or you live in the United States, and you call your cable company and you want to get some service from them or upgrade or whatever, um, the people you're talking to on the other end are probably using IBM I. Um, if you're in the U.S. and you live in a country, in a community that's under 100,000 people um, and you go and work with your law enforcement agency or your uh, county government or your city government, you're probably dealing with people who are using IBM I because those companies or those institutions bought our platform because they have specific applications that run their institution or their business really well. And as they grew up, they just continued to use it because it continued to work. So going back to the history mm-hmm. of IBM I, and you, you talked a little bit about System 38 and AS400. Can you give us just a little bit of timeline uh, you know, where did IBM I start? What was the original reason for the introduction of the IBM I? And then work us from the System 38 down to the AS400. And then I believe, and, and uh, you can help clarify this for our listeners, that uh, at one point, the AS400, which I think you'll talk about, actually had its own hardware, but now has a consolidated uh, IBM hardware, yes? Sure. Yes, that's exactly true. Um, so in the 70s, the System 38 was created It was uh, meant to be a business computer for mid-sized companies, maybe small companies. And the core architecture of IBM I came from there, although it added some architectural layers over time. And we can talk about those as well. But that was introduced in 1977, 1978. At about the same time, there was another IBM mid-range system uh, at the time, we were called microcomputers. I don't know if anybody even remembers that phrase, but there was the System 38 that I talked about, and then there was the System 36. The System 36 was really focused on ease of use. When I talk about people like dentist's offices and sheriff's offices picking up this platform, in fact, most of them initially bought the System 36 because it was by far the easiest system to manage. The System 38 had a lot of great underlying architecture that helped the platform be long-lived and very, very stable. So in the late 70s and early 80s, IBM had these two platforms, System 36 and System 38, and they decided that they wanted to take the ease of use from the System 36, but underlie it with this architecture uh, and the architectural elements from the System 38. And from that came the AS400. And the AS400 was initially introduced in 1988 as a consolidation of those two architectures. It became the most popular small medium business platform ever. Um, And then over time, it became clear that while we were developing our own specific hardware for AS400, and that included then developing all of the associated specific I.O. devices and communication capabilities, that IBM would be far better off financially if we could converge that hardware and I.O. investment with the other platforms. At the same time, we had our Unix platform, which at that point was called the RS6000. And it was off competing in the Unix marketplace, but it was also doing its own specific uh, hardware. So way back in Uh, 1998, we began our journey down a converged roadmap where the processors that we were going to all build on were the initial power processors. Now, all of us, all of our operating systems in this line are sitting on top of the power processor. We use all common I.O. And in fact, much of the I.O. that we attach today is actually uh, out there in the industry for other people to attach. Um, We attach common disks that are available to everybody else and so on. 
Whereas in the past, we had to produce our own disks and so on, and that required a lot more investment. So now we can focus our investment for IBM I. IBM I is just the name of the operating system now that sits on top of power systems that carries forward that architecture and that value that came out of the AS400. And we can just focus our uh, investment on keeping that platform doing what it does really, really well while we run on top of the power architecture. By the way, the power architecture is very widely used um, in, in the world today. It's not just running AIX or Unix. It's not just running Linux on power, and it's not just running IBM I, but there are power chips inside of all of the major gaming consoles. So a PS3, a Nintendo Wii, they're using uh, power chips. They just happen to be slightly different modified so that they can run games really fast as opposed to running businesses really fast. Now, let's get to a few things you discussed a little bit earlier. You were discussing IBM I as an object-oriented operating system, and what does that mean? Okay, well, we actually talk about it as being object-based instead of object-oriented, and, and I'll tell you a little bit about why. If software engineers listening to this will understand that an object-oriented language has certain uh, implications when you talk about it. it. It means that there are going to be objects, and those objects can only be operated upon by certain methods. That's what we usually talk about. Well, it also tends to mean, uh, in the strictest definition, that an object-oriented language allows you to do inheritance, to be able to create another object type inheriting capabilities. There is no inheritance in IBM I, and so we don't specifically call it object-oriented, but we do call it object-based because the, the step right before object-oriented is object-based. In other words, that part of what makes things an object that allows you to only operate on the object using specific operations specific to that object. And this has been really key for us to be able to have the kind of integrity and security that we have in the operating system. Now, this is different than what people are used to with the other operating systems that are most popularly known. And so let me try to explain. If you have a text file on IBM I, you can edit it and delete it, but you can't try to run it. You can't even change its name to change its, say, extension to look like a program and then run it. If it was a text object, it's a text object, and it can't be run. On the other side, if you have a program, there's no way you can go in and edit it. You can't change its name and then operate on it as an editor. It is a program object, and you can only do certain things there. So having that object-based platform allows us to ensure that each of the objects is only going to do or be operated on uh, by its intended operations. And this actually makes it very robust. Uh, things can't accidentally do things uh, to objects that they're not supposed to do. Um, we have built our security all based on roles and objects. So a role in the system might be, for example, like I'm a programmer. All right, If you have the programmer role, you can operate on a program by being able to recreate that program using uh, a compiler. But if you're just an ordinary user, you can't. And that's all based on role plus object. So I, as a programmer, might be able to use my compiler to change a, lang uh, change a program in one area, but because I'm not authorized to another object, I might not be able to do that. And so this object-based technology that we have really helps in our integrity, in our reliability, and in our security. Okay. So in Unix, everything is a file. For, for the most part, and you've got well, obviously you have ACLs, the group, and user permissions, and and things like that. Is that roughly similar, or you know, how different is it from a, for instance, a, a Unix security model? Okay, um, it's over time the Unix security model and the I model have gotten closer to one another. And let me just make clear: we have the capability to have. We have a Unix-like file system on the platform that can be used by programs, for example, Java programs that need to 
have that sort of directory structure and that sort of security model. But in each of those cases where we have that, we are still protected by our object-based and role-based security model. Whereas in the pure file system that initially came out of, out of the AS400 heritage, an object is not just a file. An object has a specific type. So if you have a message queue, it's not a file with messages in it. It is an object called a message queue, which can have attached to it objects that are message objects. And they can be operated upon by reading from the message queue, putting something on the message queue, but they aren't just files that can be read and written. You use specific APIs, application programming interfaces, to op make those operations happen. Yet in a file system that looks more like a Unix file system, you can do all the normal F opens, F closes, writes and reads, that sort of thing. You're still going through the object-based security model because even in that Unix-like file system, you're running under a user profile and you are operating upon that thing even though you're using an F open, F close, a read write. You have to have authority to that file object just as you would on a Unix type system. It's just, it's based on our user profile as opposed to the kind of Un Unix users that are out there. So it sounds like it's, even the services themselves are exposed as objects from the system. That is true, that is true. One other thing that you said, which I, I find fascinating here is a single level store. Mm -hmm. This is probably, you know, getting down into the, into the weeds here of the platform, but I think this is probably sets apart IBM I from most other operating systems and, and possibly has impact on the programming model. Can you describe what the single level store is? Sure. Single level store is a key concept because it is one of the architectures that defines how we do everything we do at the lowest levels of the operating system, and yet programmers often don't need to be aware of it. Single level store let me give you kind of a, an analogy that a programmer would understand. Single level store treats every bit of storage that's attached to IBM I as if it were memory, starting at byte zero and going all the way up to 16 bytes worth of addressable storage. Okay, So from a programmer's point of view, you don't have to uh, worry about whether you're going to overrun memory because memory is storage. For you, and you just said 16 bytes. Is that 128 bits? Yep. Okay, so that, that's really a 128-bit address space? That's, that's correct. Yes. So every, every program, even if you're writing in a language that only has um, you know, a, a pointer that's a four-byte pointer, under the covers, we are treating all of our storage as if it were this long, long string of memory, okay? And because of that, we don't force where things are on disk because we need to know at the lowest levels of the operating system, we need to know where every bit of memory, which is really storage, where it is so that we can balance things under the covers to perform as well as possible. So in other operating systems, we tend to um, force administrators or programmers to know specifically on which volume or which disk things are stored. That is not the case in IBM I. In IBM I, that's taken care of by our integrated storage management. And it's all based on this single level store. Again, it doesn't get exposed necessarily to a customer who's writing an application, except that it simplifies things because he doesn't need to know or, or try to manage in which set of storage is his file located or is his program located. And we have a lot of algorithms under the covers to make sure that the data that is most frequently being read and written is in the best possible storage locations. And so, for example, when we introduced solid state drives here two years ago, solid state drives are much, much faster than spinning drives. Not quite as fast as memory, but you know, pretty fast. Well, because our single level store and our integrated storage management know that those solid state drives are out there and that they're much faster, we can balance and put data there 
if a customer is, for example, reading a lot of their customer data at the end of the month, um, we can make sure that that data migrates onto those solid state drives. And again, the customer didn't need to worry about that. The application certainly didn't need to change. And we were able to take advantage of that because under the covers with single level store, we're having to do all of that management. The address space itself is, you know, I guess the only way I could put an analogy to it is, you know, I take a look at uh, a file system and I've got a certain level of storage and, and some of that is, is set aside as swap or something. Is single level store like a memory map, like a big memory map file? Is How does it eventually become durable then? Okay. Yeah, it is. It's it's similar to a memory map. You can think about that again at the lowest level of IBMI's operating system. The storage management components have to know, based on portions of the address, on which piece of storage it should go look to do the read. So there is some mapping done based on uh, header information that's part of the part of the pointer, um, where to go look for that. But when we put something in memory, when somebody does a write, we are going to force that thing out onto the disk that it's associated with. And this is actually something very similar to what a lot of operating systems do. Right? You put something in memory and you keep it there because you know that the programs have been using it heavily. But you send it out to backing store as soon as it's going to be convenient, as soon as you have a bunch of stuff to put out there. So while I've said that all of our storage is treated as if it were one big stream of memory, and that's absolutely true. A portion of that is essentially mirrored in, in the memory from the system and gets forced out when, um, when it's convenient and has the performance to do so. So we are very historically reliable. We put the data out as quickly as we can to, to permanent backing store, but we treat every piece of backing store as if it were memory so that we can manage things under the covers to make things as efficient as possible in our memory and storage usage. Programs and programs themselves are not explicitly sending things to backing store. I mean, basically they're, they're allocating space and should it need to be stored, go to that backing store, the operating system is doing it for them. That's right. We also have a temporary file system that people can use if they know that they're creating data that's never going to need to go out to backing store. Many web programs, for example, store things in files that they never really intend to put out on backing store. And so we have a portion of our file system that is the temporary file system. But by and large, you'll find that most applications, when they say they want to write something to disk, they don't care how to write it to disk. They just say, I want to store this information. And they expect IBM I is going to put it out there and keep track of it. And that's what we do. Sounds very similar to, I just read a, some architecture notes on the project Varnish. And I'm going to forget uh, the person who, who wrote that. So I won't, uh, I won't attempt his name to uh, just out of respect, but okay. something very similar saying, you know, it's 1975 programming that so many programs and so many operating systems are still using in that we, we maintain programs with the concept of two different areas. We have a memory area and we have a, and we have a storage, we have a file system or some other area. Mm -hmm. And the operations that we use between them, we're just doing it in such an old model. You know, we need to, that's not the way that really operating systems need to be, be looked at. And it sounds like IBM taking care of that for quite some time then. Yes, that's been our, our hallmark um, since the beginning. We knew for a long time, and it's finally coming into existence, that while spinning disks are still always going to be used for certain things, eventually things like solid state drives would get out there. And you would want to be able to treat everything that you're putting on your system as if it were just part of memory. And of course, the amount of memory that's in the system these days is huge. If people are still trying to manage memory versus disk separately in their applications, there is a certain amount of that that is becoming less and less necessary because of the speeds at which data can be referred to both on disk as well as solid state disk and memory itself. I've got a question about uh, DB2 that you discussed. Oh, sure. uh, li little bit earlier, you said IBM I has DB2. Is that embedded or does that just come with IBM I? What, how is DB2 integrated here? Oh, this is a great question and another huge differentiator between us and other operating systems. So it's a good thing to talk about. 
if you remember what I talked about the history here of the system 38 and the system 36, we knew that every business is going to use its computers to store data. That's that's their business. That's their data. So we knew that every application that was going to be written to run on top of this was going to need a database. So the architecture of the System 38 and then the AS400 was, we're going to make our machine be a database machine. We're going to embed a database within it. The operating system is going to use the database anytime it needs to store data. The database is always going to have access to the lowest levels of the operating system so it can interact very well with this single level store. So DB2 on I started out as our own internal architected integrated database. Now over time the DB2 brand was invented uh, in IBM so that we could uh, compete in the database market and other DB2s, such as the ones that are run on Linux, Unix, and Windows, are sold as separate products that run on top of operating systems. We became DB2 on I when we adopted the same standards that were being used in other databases, and in particular, other DB2s. So you can access our integrated database using completely standard SQL, SQL that will run on every other platform. Under the covers, then, that gets translated into the database operations on our machine. I, I want to make this clear because most databases are actually written as if um, they are a separate layer on top of a file system such as other people have. Not so here. We have multiple layers of our operating system. We can talk about that in a minute if you want to. There's an upper level of the operating system where when you compile a C program, for example, uh, it gets compiled to use that upper level of the operating system and all of the APIs. But it actually gets compiled into a kind of intermediate language that we call the technology independent machine interface. And then below that, is a layer of the operating system that no user program can touch. It's sort of like a kernel, but there's a lot more in it than a kernel. Well, some of those MI, TIMI operations are actually database operations. When you compile your program and it's got SQL in it, it's actually compiling to a set of instructions that are database instructions. It's going to build an index. It's going to do a query. In fact, many of the indexes that get built are actually built under the covers without the APIs uh, being exposed at all, without the applications needing to know it. So our DB2 is actually the grown-up version of this integrated database that we put out there before there was an SQL, before there were even standards on how to do uh, database operations and we use it as an integrated part of managing the system. So there is no separating DB2 from the IBM I operating system. It's inherent to it. What makes it much like the other DB2s is the standard interfaces that can be used. And then what makes it different from other DB2s as well as other databases out there in the industry is because we have integrated this and because it's built on top of this single level store architecture, there's much less database administration that needs to be done by a user. Many of the things to make sure that tables are spread properly across disks so that we get the right performance, building indices that are going to be used commonly often gets done automatically by our operating system and by our DB2 as opposed to having to have a database administrator figure that all out. So that's what we talk about, what we mean when we talk about DB2 being part of IBM I as opposed to uh, sitting on top of it. Expand a little bit. You said uh, there's kind of the upper and lower levels. And when you went to the upper levels, you're talking about SQL, APIs, making mm -hmm. query, JDBC, in and, and obtain data back. But you talked about lower level and you were talking about... Yeah. So TIMI, sometimes we call it the MI, sometimes we call it TIMI, TIMI. Again, it means technology independent machine interface. We have two layers of our operating system, as I mentioned. Our operating system at the upper level, pure IBM I part of it, it gets compiled to this technology-independent machine interface. 
and so do applications. They also get compiled to this technology-independent machine interface. Again, several kinds of operations there, the kinds of operations you would expect to see, reads and writes and so on, but they also have these specialized things for our database. Now, the reason that we have that TIMI, that machine-independent interface, is that we knew that over time, things like processor models, I.O. and so on, they're going to change. But we didn't want to have to force customers to recompile for those changes. So we were initially, for example, a 48-bit machine. When the AS400 came out, it was a 48-bit machine. But our programmers, uh, the people who write applications on top of the platform, didn't need to worry about that. They wrote their programs dealing with pointers and spaces and so on in their language, whatever language they were writing in, RPG, C, whatever. And it would get compiled down to this MI. And those instructions didn't have any awareness of what the capabilities were of the processor underneath. So when we moved from a 48-bit processor to a 64-bit processor, such that we're doing today, the lower level of the operating system underneath that machine-independent interface, okay, that had to change. But the upper level of the operating system didn't need to, and furthermore, the applications didn't need to be recompiled because the applications were not compiled down to that 48-bit machine. They were actually compiled to this intermediate layer. And then when you installed your program or you restored your program, from the 48-bit machine onto the 64-bit machine, we were able to do all the retranslation of those uh, instructions because you had been compiled to this intermediate step. We could automatically do that retranslation to run on the new hardware. And that has happened several times as we've moved. So we actually have programs that were written for the System 38 that customers have out there or for the System 36 that customers have out there that haven't been changed or recompiled since 1980, but they still run on our system because they were initially compiled to that technology independent machine interface, and we've been able to carry along that functionality because we haven't forced those customers to recompile even as we've changed underlying I.O. or underlying processor technologies. Okay, that sounds remarkably like a Java runtime or CLR.NET runtime. That's right. It's 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 that concept only applied to everything that runs on the system, including older languages that were compiled. Java has that concept, and it's it's totally understandable why you would want to get to that, right? You don't want to have to recompile based on um, technology changes. When the code runs. There's, there's a little bit of a difference there, I think. You are saying that it's not just recompiled, but it is compiled into machine code. The, the program itself, the program text is, is still machine independent, but then when it runs, it's automatically recompiled into machine code? Yeah, that's essentially the case. It, and that's, it is a very important distinction between uh, Java and what we're doing here. When when you write your program and compile it, it gets compiled to this set of machine instructions, the MI. And then we take care of actually running each of those instructions with a bunch of microcode that sits underneath that. So when we move from processor technology A to processor technology B, we change what's happening as you execute each of those and so you really don't need to recompile. All of your code is still written into that same language, but we change the underlying uh, implementation, the underlying machine instructions, actual machine instructions that gets run. So really what's happening is as you put this program that you've written uh, and restore it from one technology onto another, there is a retranslation that happens where we re-implement under the covers the actual implementation of each of these MI instructions. And so you're not, you're not um, just simulating what would happen 
on this new box. There's no simulation layer going on. There's no uh, just-in-time kind of recompilation going on. It's actually replacing the implementation of the instruction set that does your application with the new instruction set that's necessary. So very much like a, a, it's it's kind of it's it's both. So you're going to have you're going to have some intermediate mm -hmm. code, and you're also going to do down down to the bare metal code. That's right, and right. and it doesn't have to be done each time because it becomes part of that implementation. Yep. So let's move on to to scaling, <clears throat> and uh, in IBM I and scaling, a lot of you know a lot of the the thought out there is you know IBM. Systems generally uh, scale up versus scale out, um, but I know that's not necessarily all the case. Can you discuss for us just a little bit more on the scaling architecture? How does IBM I scale both up as as well as out to, to hit those critical loads, whether that happens to be business loads or Internet loads or, or anything? Okay. Yeah, I'd be happy to talk about this. And, and to do it, we're going to have to get into somewhat of a comparison of how our system is used versus – say, Unix and Windows. First of all, we can scale to have a single partition of I run in less than a core on a power system, all the way up to 32 or even 64 cores. Um, and to be honest, that's what most of our customers do. As they have more and more business need, as they want to run more and more on our platform. They tend to just activate more processors on the power processor system that they have, and we run bigger and bigger. Now, let me explain why. Our operating system, with its subsystem architecture, was intended to be a system where you could run multiple workloads on the same operating system, use our work management capabilities, to balance which of those workloads should get more of the processor, more memory, more attention, and during which times of the day. It also uses this object-based and role-based security model to make sure that two different workloads don't interfere with one another. So our customers, when they created their initial business application, had things running in one subsystem. But when they wanted to add to that, web-based programming, for example, and add a web server, they could add that in a separate subsystem, keep those two apart and give enough resources to the web server, but continue to run their primary business application. Can you, can you clarify real quick with the, sure. just, just for me, the, the subsystem, what is the difference between, is, is a subsystem an instance of IBM I or is it a partition of processes in the, in the operating system? What is a subsystem? All right. A subsystem is a virtualization technology that was created initially in System 38, but it is a way for a user to create a smaller system within the larger system that is isolated from everything else, but is managed by the operating system itself. So. I'll use the example of a web server versus, say, a payroll system. I can put my payroll application in a payroll subsystem, and I can say this has the highest priority and should get at least 50% of the memory at all times. Then I can create another subsystem within that partition and say here's where my web server is going to run. Okay. It has lower priority, but it needs to be able to respond very quickly, and I configure information about each of those. Now, notice it is not a separate partition. It's running with the same image of IBM I managing it, and those attributes that control how important or how much memory a particular application, a particular subsystem is, they're across this single partition. So we created the concept because we knew that people might want payroll to react differently than their web server, even though at the time web servers didn't even exist, or whatever other kind of application they might want to run. We knew that customers would like to be able to manage all of that together as one system. Now, over time, as the industry grew up, what we find is that, for example, a Windows shop will have their 
business application running on one system, one physical system. And when they would want to do a web server, they would buy another system and put the two boxes next to each other on a network, and that's how they would grow up. So they ended up in those situations with many, many physical systems. And when they wanted to start doing database applications and try and take advantage of the fact that they had multiple boxes out there, they wanted to scale out a database. Our customers didn't have that situation. They have one box that's running most of their stuff. And they want to make sure that we can scale up, but they don't really care about adding a separate box because they want all those workloads to be running on that same system. So we typically don't talk about scaling out very much on IBM I because our customer set wants to be able to manage things all within their one box. Now, over time, we, of course, created partitioning as well. When two businesses merged and they were both using the AS400 or the IBM I, they would often create a partition for one and a partition for the other. And then over time, those two things existed as if they were two separate boxes. But by and large, most of our customers use the subsystem model to provide the kind of isolation that you can get, that you can count on from a partition, but also if you want to not have them quite so isolated, have them be managed by the entire system, the operating system, the one partition. Okay, so really there's, if, if you think about it, IBM I provides, just like you said, a, a virtualization within the operating system itself for, and, and again, coming from a, uh, myself from a Unix background, those are those set of processes against which you can put certain workload and goal metrics. That's right. That's okay. right. Well, let's move on to uh, language support. I, I, you know, I think maybe you can talk a little bit about the traditional language support and in, in programming within IBM I, but then maybe move into, you know, how is programming on I different than programming on Windows or, or Apple or any flavor of Unix thereof? So, again, historically, um, our customer base was interested in buying applications. A dentist off a store or a small bank didn't want to have to be writing their own applications. So it was very key to us that we had thousands and still have thousands of independent software vendors who would write software for our platform. And we found that a lot of them could make a, a very good living because we created a programming environment initially with a, a set of languages that were very oriented towards doing business operations. The most common languages uh, in the early 90s, late 80s on our platform were two languages, one of which people would have heard about, COBOL. Everybody knew, knew COBOL in those days. And then there was another language called RPG. And those were very tied to our architecture. Um, COBOL, of course, was a standard, but there were very easy uh, extensions to it that could use our object-based and our, our database model and so on. And many programs got written in those languages, and they still continue to exist. And because of the MI and our technology-independent machine interface, those things can move forward without, without even being re recompiled. We were very successful with those, but of course there were other languages that were being developed that other people were learning and they have their own advantages as well. So we very quickly added support for C, C++, and then we really got into Java at the same time as IBM got committed to Java back in the 90s. So in addition to those initial languages that were written, you can write in standard C, standard C++, or standard Java, and run that on top of IBM I as well. Now, can it be different running on IBM I? It certainly can. If you want to write a Java program or a C program that specifically takes advantage of some of the database operations that aren't available in SQL, you can do that. Or you can use those languages in a pure environment, use pure SQL to access the database, and you 
are, will be able to run that same program on another platform. Similarly, if you wanted to take advantage of the fact that you know that on this platform there is a role-based security model and an object-based security model, you could build your application, and many of our customers have done that, in Java and C and C++, accessing specific APIs to the IBM I platform that make their uh, application aware of those technologies and therefore take advantage of them. On the other hand, if you don't want to, you don't have to do that. So in fact, over time, many of our customers who used to write only in COBOL or RPG have actually added things like C and C++ to their repertoire. And then how integrated they are with the operating system really depends on whether they want to implement those same pieces of software on other platforms or whether they're just going to use them on IBM I, in which case they tend to take advantage of what we're doing. These days, we have an Eclipse-based development tool set that can do programming or can allow you to do programming much like you do on any other platform because the tools are all based on the open source Eclipse framework. Okay, And so you can write your Java, your C, your C++, or PHP, which I'll talk about in a minute. You can write those things using that Eclipse-based tool set, but then the target for those those programs, those applications, can be your IBM I. So I think that by and large, most people who ever heard of AS400 thought that we were proprietary and different and old because we only had these uh, old languages that other people don't know about. But the misconception there is that uh, you have to write in those languages. And no, you don't. You can write in these other ones. There, there's a few other languages that I support. Smalltalk, Python, and I think you mentioned something about PHP. Mm -hmm. Yep. So all of those are supported. PHP is the one that our customers uh, were really, really asking for. And we uh, got into business with the Zend Corporation. They're the folks who, uh, the people who work for Zend are the people who invented PHP in the first place. And they're out there in the open source community distributing PHP and add-on products. We started working with them, I think it's been five years ago now, because on our platform, we actually have what's called PACE. It's an environment that allows us to run AIX programs directly on our within IBM I. Because we have the same underlying power architecture, we're able to put an environment there that can take an AIX binary and just run it straight without having to do any interpretation or translation or anything. Well, PHP, the Zend Corporation, had a version of their, their PHP support that could run directly on AIX. And we said, you know what? Our customers have been asking for PHP so that they could implement web programs. And our customers wanted to be able to do web programming in addition to doing it in Java, also doing it in PHP. So we went out and worked with Zend uh, to get the version of their PHP stack that would run on a Unix. There was a version of it that would run on an AIX, and then we were able to integrate that directly into IBM I. It's been extremely successful. Now, there's other languages you mentioned. They're, they're available on the platform, but they don't have a lot of people writing in them. Nevertheless, the people who are using them, of course, get that same advantage of moving from release to release without recompiling unless they want to take advantage of new technology. Um, but it's the PHP that's been really taking off. One of the other – I'm not going to call it a language, but one of the other technologies, one of the other stacks that I've read is on IBM I is MySQL. Mm -hmm. But DB2 is integrated. Do you, is it – is that a separate install? Can you tell me a little bit about that MySQL integration? Sure. So MySQL, uh, a couple of years back, created the ability to have a separate backing store. It essentially allowed, the, allowed you to think about MySQL as a database language, not a language plus a backing store. Now, most MySQL implementations assumed that MySQL was, in fact, both the language and the database behind it. But they didn't need to think of it that way. They could just write their, 
their database operations in the MySQL language and really didn't need to know what was under the covers. So when MySQL allowed this essentially layering approach, we created a plugin underneath MySQL that would actually store data when it was operated upon by MySQL in our DB2 for I. So you can, and our customers are using this, you can access the DB2 information on I using the MySQL language. And so this has allowed us to pull in a lot of open source applications that were written with a MySQL database storage um, and with our storage engine plugged in under the covers, customers can store that data from an open source application in their DB2 for I so they can protect it and manage it the same way that they, they do all their others. Plus, it's allowed us the ability to have data that's been sitting there for decades be accessed now by MySQL operations. We are not um, replacing MySQL on our platform with DB2, and we are not replacing DB2 with MySQL. We're treating MySQL as another essentially programming interface to get at the same level of DB2. As I said before, DB2 can't even be separated from I, so the real uh, value that MySQL has is essentially as a programming interface that other people are aware of and more aware of in the web community than other places, but that they're aware of that can get at that same level of data. So when I so, create a, a MySQL schema hmm. and a table in that schema, yep. that is available via db 2 for i that's right. It gets stored in db 2 for i That all that information is in db 2 for i And if you wanted to use SQL or even our old programming interfaces for our old way of doing database to get at that data, it's all stored in db 2 for i Now, it's both the syntax and the wire pro protocol for MySQL, which is can expose out to all these common libraries and and and, uh, and other programs. That's it's very well put. That's exactly true. It's that. It's that set of protocols and interfaces into a database, um, you know, sort of like JDBC, right? JDBC is the extension to Java or the, the part of Java that allows you to do access of database data. Here we treat MySQL very similarly, right? All the protocols that are associated with MySQL still are those protocols. But now when you actually get to where is the data stored, we have this extra storage engine that we use just to put it in DB2. Okay, fascinating. That's actually that I, I could see that being uh, being quite useful. You know, MySQL, uh, you know, front end and then uh, back end query through DB2. Yep, and yep. and those two things put together, uh, we have a we have a set of our customers. They call themselves the Yips, the young eye professionals. Um, people who are in their you know, 20s and 30s who are using this platform, a lot of them grew up and were educated using things like PHP and MySQL. And so they can naturally put their stuff on the platform, but they've also gone out and found lots of open source applications, put them on the platform so that they can get you know readily implemented, for example, bulletin boards for their companies and so on. They're all being running on I but using PHP and MySQL because that's what the open source application does. And so that's extended the number of applications that our customers have available to them many times because of the capabilities we have with this set of open source technologies. Talk to me about the roadmap. Going into this year, 2011, and into the next year and, and beyond, what do you have planned for IBMI? All right, well, that's a it's a great question. And, takes way more time than we probably have, but let me give you some highlights. Right now, our customer set has grown up from being a set of customers who are very isolated from one another um, from a technology viewpoint to companies that, like everybody else, are more and more connected to the internet. And so, of course, we have all the internet capabilities that are expected of an operating system. But one of the things that these companies have been wanting to do is to move more and more of their business processing um, onto the net and not necessarily have those things be on-site systems. So I mentioned before our ISV community. 
we have many ISVs who have transformed their business over time to not just selling a power system into a client and then putting their application on it, but also offering versions of their software that can run as a service over the internet. So we have several good examples of ISVs like this, for example, who are running tens, twenties, hundreds of institutions all within one power system running IBM I over the network. This software as a service kind of thing has become a pretty common way for our clients to do their business. Well, there's one more step that they want to be able to take, which is to essentially do that in a cloud environment, be able to easily deploy a new business to be able to offer their services across across the network. And there are some underlying technologies that we need to make happen within the operating system in order for us to do that. So there will be a lot of cloud-based technologies coming out uh, related to IBM I between now and three, four years from now. Part of my job as a strategist, as an architect, is to look out and see when are our customers really going to be able to consume that. And I imagine that there will be a great adoption of that over the course of the next few years because it ends up being a, a way to reliably give the customers, the end user customers, the same kind of simple application they have before, but consolidating the management of that into locations such as our ISVs location. So that's one thing. The other thing that I would say on our roadmap is that we've recently introduced some new DB2 technology that's common now across all of the DB2s related to XML support within a database so that you can do operations on a database uh, object that are that's actually stored in XML and you can do that natively without having to you know, deconstruct the XML and store it all in columns and then reconstruct it when you need to reconstruct it. That is getting significant new work done to it by all of the databases in the industry, in particular the DB2s. And so we're working with the rest of the DB2 architects to make sure that we extend that because so much of what is going on in the industry today is exchanging data via the internet using XML as a way to, of course, describe that data. And so there will be more that's going on there than ever before. Any of our listeners want to know and learn more, uh, specifically how might they get involved or learn more about the development, where can they go? Okay, well, the first place to go, if you specifically want to hear from me, is I I write a blog. Um, it's from the IBM Systems Magazine blog, so or website. So mine is, in particular, is at IBM Systems Mag. Dot blogs dot com and my my blog is called you and I so u underscore and underscore I so you can look for me there and you can learn more I write a blog where I publish about once every week or two that talks about strategy that talks about architecture sometimes specific to I or sometimes just in general I also talk about upcoming roadmaps and things like that and then if you want to find information about IBM I itself uh, you probably want to start at IBM.com and look at the power systems information there. We have an entire page that's dedicated to I. It has some really good papers connected to it. This little bit that we talked about, about why you would use IBM I. I have a presentation that's out there that people can go get. Um, there, We link to information that that was done as a study to show the low total cost of ownership for our platform. That's all out there, as well as links into our basic information about IBM I. And then there is actually some YouTube information out there. I talked about this YI presentation. Um, somebody in our user group captured me doing a webcast of this YI, and it's out there available on uh, YouTube as well. Um, so people can find information primarily those ways. Okay, great. Well, we'll we'll make sure to provide those links. You bet. If an application developer wants to play around and create an application on our platform, there actually is a method not to download it, the capability onto your PC, but to actually access it over the internet. There is a 
program called the Virtual Loaner Program, which allows a, a partner, and really to be a partner at IBM, um, all you have to do is sign up and say, I, I want to write an application. Okay, So if you're a partner at IBM, you can reserve time on what they call these virtual loaners. And really, it's just a partition that looks like an IBM I system, and you can play around and create things and do your programming and you know put those programs onto the platform and so on. Now, typically, when people are doing this, they're already partners and they have the rational tool set and so on. But if somebody wanted to play with that kind of thing, they could download a version of the, the rational developer tool set for power um, in a trial basis. They could sign up and get a virtual loaner and, and do some programming and, and mess with it that way. But because we're an entirely different architecture than the x86 processors that most people are running around with in their PCs, uh, there's no real way to develop it and then run it on your PC. Uh, instead, you need to have access to something. And that's kind of what the virtual loaner program is for. Because we tend at our architectural level to assume we control every bit of disk that we have, it's a little difficult for us to be like an environment running on a PC because we have to, we would somehow have to be told, here's the disk that you're allowed to assume is your single level store. And that's not something we typically um, you know, need to worry about. Well, Steve, thank you very much. Is there anything else that you would like to add? No, I really appreciate this opportunity to uh, talk to your audience. I'm always looking to reach out. I do a, a great deal of speaking to customers because in my job, trying to find out what is going to happen in five years from now really involves listening to what our clients are dealing with today that they are going to need solved in that time frame. And so it's exciting to be able to have an audience to tell this to so that I might hear from other people about the kinds of issues that they're seeing and how operating systems can help them in the future. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening to Software Engineering Radio. SE Radio is an educational program brought to you by Hillside Europe. If you want more information about the podcast and the other episodes, visit our website at se-radio.net. If you want to support us, you can donate to the SE Radio team via the website or you can advertise for SE Radio, for example, by clicking on the Dick Reddit Delicious and Slash Dot buttons or by talking about us on Twitter and Facebook. You can also support us by joining the team and shouldering some of the work. To contact the team, please send an email to team at se-radio.net or if your feedback is specific to an episode, please use the comments facility on the website so other people can react to your comments. This episode of SE Radio, as well as all other episodes, are licensed under a Creative Commons 2.5 license. Please see the website for details. Yeah.